messy people and a merciful God. We'll read and then I'll sort of lay some foundation for you about the book of Judges. Judges chapter 1. Now after the death of Joshua, it came to pass that the children of Israel asked the Lord, saying, Who shall be first to go up for us against the Canaanites and fight against them? So that gives you a little idea of the chronology of where we are in the story. Joshua has passed on, and now it's time for the people of God to carry on. They do not have this one single anointed leader that they've been so used to. For two generations, they followed Moses and they followed Joshua. Only two people they followed for two generations, and now they're in a, in a sort of a new, this is new to them. Verse 2, and so the Lord said, Judah shall go up. Indeed, I have delivered the land into his hand. So Judah said to Simeon, his brother, come up with me to my allotted territory that we might fight against the Canaanites, and I will likewise go with you to the allotted territory. And Simeon went with him. Verse 4, then Judah went up, and the Lord delivered the Canaanites and the Perizzites into their hand and killed 10,000 men at Bezek. And they found Adonai Bezek in Bezek and fought against him, and they defeated the Canaanites and the Perizzites. Then Adonai Bezek fled, and they pursued him and caught him and cut off his thumbs and big toes. Verse 7, And Adonai Bezek said, Seventy kings with their thumbs and big toes cut off used to gather scraps under my table, as I have done, so God has repaid me. Then they brought him to Jerusalem, and there he died. Now the children of Judah fought against Jerusalem and took it. They struck it with the edge of the sword, and they set fire to the city. And afterward, the children of Judah went down to fight against the Canaanites who dwell in the mountains in the south and in the lowlands. Then Judah went against the Canaanites to dwell at Hebron. And they killed Sheshai, Ahaman, and Talmai. All names for you. Just be giving you those names for your grandkids. From there... They went against the inhabitants of Debir. Then Caleb said, who, by the way, is about 85 at this point, whoever attacks Ker Josephar and takes it, to him I will give my daughter Aksa as wife. Then Othniel, the son of Canaz, Caleb's younger brother, took it, so, that's Caleb, gave his daughter Aksa as his wife. Now it happened when she came to him that she urged him to ask her father for a field. And he dis, so she dismounted from her donkey. It's a tough girl now. She's riding her donkey. And Caleb said to her, what do you wish? And she said to him, give me a blessing. Since you have given me a land in the south, give me also springs of water. And Caleb gave her the upper springs and the lower springs. Now the children of the Canaanite, uh, of the Canaanite Moses' father-in-law, went up from the city of Palms with the children of Judah into the wilderness of Judah, which lies south near Arad. And they went and dwelt among the people. And Judah went with his brother Simeon, and they attacked the Canaanites who inhabited Zephah the, and utterly destroyed it. So the name of the city was called Hormah. Also Judah took Gaza and its territory, Ashkelon, with the territory of Ekron, with its territory. So the Lord was with Judah, and they drove out the mountaineers, but they could not drive out the inhabitants of the lowland because they had chariots of iron. And they gave Hebron to Caleb, as Moses had said. Then he expelled from there the three sons of Anak. But the children of Benjamin did not drive out the Jebusites who inhabited Jerusalem, so the Jebusites dwell with the children of Benjamin in Jerusalem to this day. And the house of Joseph also went up against Bethel, and the Lord was with them. So the house of Joseph sent men to spy out Bethel, and when the spies saw the man coming out of the city, they said to him, Well, please show us the entrance to the city, and we will show you mercy. So he showed them the entrance to the city, and they struck the city with, with the edge of the sword, and they let the man and all his family go. The man went to the land of the Hittites. He built a city, and he called its name Luz, which is its name to this day. However, Manasseh did not drive out the inhabitants of Beth Shean and its villages at Tanakh and its villages and the inhabitants of Dor and its villages and the inhabitants of Ibrahim and its villages 
and the inhabitants of Megiddo and its villages, for the Canaanites were determined to dwell in that land. And it came to pass when Israel was strong that they put the Canaanites under forced labor but did not completely drive them out, nor did Ephraim drive out the Canaanites who dwell in Gezer. So the Canaanites dwelt in Gezer among them. Nor did Zebulun drive out the inhabitants of Kidron and the inhabitants of Nahalon. So the Canaanites dwelt among them and were put under forced labor. Nor did Asher drive out the inheritance of Akko and the inhabitants of Sidon and Alab and Ashdod and Helba and Aphek and Rehob. So the Asherites dwelt among the Canaanites and, and the inhabitants of the land, for they did not drive them out, nor did Naphtali drive out the inhabitants of Beth Shemesh. For the inhabitants of Beth Anak, but they dwelt among the Canaanites and the inhabitants of the land. Nevertheless, the inhabitants of Beth she Shemesh and Beth Anath were put under forced labor to them. And the Amorites forced the children of Dan into the mountains, for they would not allow them to come down in the valley. And the Amorites were determined to dwell in Mount Heres and Agilon and Shablim. Yet, when the strength of the house of Joseph became greater, they were put under forced labor. Now the boundary of the Amorites was from the ascent of Akrabim to Selah and upward. Now I know that sounds like a bunch of junk, but let me tell you something. That is filled with very important information. So let me just try to break some of this down for you. Let me give you a little bit of an overview of what we're doing, and then I'll pick this thing apart, and it will all make sense to you, except for the crazy names. The book of Judges is basically what's happening after Joshua and his generation have died. Remember, the Bible said that the people served the Lord and followed him, followed the Lord all the days of Joshua and the generation to follow. It was after Joshua passed on and the men that he had around him passed on, that's when the wheels came off and the Bible said, and then rose another generation that did not follow the Lord. Now what we're going to see is that their failure to do as God commanded now has its consequences. There's a lag time, isn't there? There's disobedience, and consequences don't come immediately, do they? No, there's a lag time. And so... I always say that's what makes sin pleasurable for a season, in the lag time. It's when the hammer falls, all of a sudden it's, uh-oh. But in the lag time, you know, people think, well, okay. So here's what they had done. Number one, they had forgotten Moses' promises. Moses was very, you could not be more specific than Moses was in the book of Deuteronomy. He laid it out, I mean, precept by precept of exactly what they were to do, mainly because Moses was so concerned that they wouldn't do the right thing. And he loved them. And after everything he'd been through, he really wanted his legacy to, to be great. And so he was very, very, uh, he made sure everybody knew what to do. Then they disregarded Joshua's warnings. Joshua, on the other hand, basically came behind was executing everything that Moses had said and was continually not really repeating what Moses had said, but warning them about do the things you've been told to do by Moses. Be faithful, be courageous, be strong. Don't, don't cower down, don't chicken out. And thus they failed to obey ultimately God's commands. So Moses gave them promises, Joshua gave them warnings, and both of those led to a failure to obey God's commands. Instead, what they did was they accommodated the sin in their land. You should have picked up on this. Comp there was so much repetitive language. Don't get distracted by all those crazy names. Just look at the things you can understand and just see how repetitive over and over it's the same thing. They, disre they, they rebelled. They rebelled. And they eventually loved false gods and hated their own brothers and sisters. You see, what happens is, notice how the chapter began. 
the very first verse of the book of Judges says, the people in unity come before God. Now this, this is unprecedented. When do, when do the people come to God? They don't come to God. Moses goes to God. Joshua goes to God. Now you've got this group of people looking around, scratching their head, thinking, okay, what do we do? They go to God in unity, and they say, God, who, they know what they, but you notice they don't say, what, do, what are we supposed to do? They know. They know what Moses has told them. They got all their instructions. The only question they have is, who goes first? And God says, Judah. Judah is the chosen tribe. It's the tribe that David comes from, the, the, the line of Jesus. It's the big tribe. It's the power tribe. It's Simeon. He takes Simeon with him. Um, some people think that that's a, an act of disobedience because God didn't specifically say take Simeon with you. But I don't see it that way. Simeon, actually, if you understand how the, the land was divided, Simeon is within the borders of Judah's space. And so they were basically, Simeon was a smaller, weaker group. And to me, it shows unity that they're going together. It's kind of like they're, you know, taking your little brother. So they go together. So God says, go, I've already gone before you. And then there's this, this landslide of excuses. So-and-so went in. At first, we beat the Perizzites and the Hittites and then well, and then we didn't do so good here. And then they had iron chariots. And then we didn't drive them out. And then they were taken in the lowlands. And then, and pretty soon the phrase is, but they didn't drive them out. But they didn't drive them out. But they didn't drive them out. And it gets worse and worse and worse. There's a progression where it just continually gets worse. All right. Meanwhile, what you're not hearing, but what you will be hearing uh, in the book of Malachi, when we jump into that, uh, is a lot of talk about the priests, but here you don't hear that. See, the priests, they're charged with protecting the purity of worshiping God's family. They're barely mentioned in the book of Judges because they have so utterly failed to do their job, they're, they're almost non-existent. Like, if you, if you didn't know what was going on through reading other books, you wouldn't even know there were priests. They were just... They had just lost uh, all, remember, this is, this is on the backside of Ezra and Nehemiah, and so they, they're coming off of this big time of revival, and then the, you know, and, and prosperity, and so on and so forth, and the priests have just lost it. Now, this is very important, and we will be going over this week after week after week. It may not be every week, but it will be, you will hear this continually, what we're about to talk about. There is a cycle of sin in the book of Judges, and it is very obvious, and it is God puts it there for a very specific reason to teach us and instruct us. So the record of God's people in Judges is a, is a cyclical tale of worship and rebellion. And we're going to talk through these steps. Worship. It starts with worship and ends with rebellion. And then, so God is consistently faithful to his promises while man is consistently unfaithful to his obligations. So what Judges does is it teaches us about ourselves. It teaches us about the, uh, the, our, the tendencies of our flesh and our natural. I mean, we're going to see, this is, all of us in this room is going to be a picture of this. And then, but it's going to create some tension for you. Some good tension. It's going to cause you to really think and go, hmm, all right? So through all the stories we're going to hear in Judges, here's this seven-step progression that's going to go around in circles. Um, well, the pattern not only describes the relationship between God and his people in the narrative, but it also parallels the experience of our own relationship with him. So, relationship, relationship. So, we're in this relationship. I just want you to kind of think this through for a second. You're in a relationship with somebody. The relationship is constant. It doesn't change. The experience of that relationship is, a, is, a, is an up and down, uh, ever-changing 
landscape. I'm not talking about your marriages. No. Look for fun. We'll just say we're talking about your relationship with your children. How about that? Yeah. But here's the thing. They're always your children, aren't they? They don't not become your children. But it's up and down, isn't it? Of course it is. Okay? Relationship is constant. Experience changes. Got that? Okay. Here's your seven steps. Number one, the Israelites sin by worshiping false gods. By the way, it's the same seven steps that we take. Same seven steps. Something else gets more important than God, and the train begins to ease off the track. Number two, the Lord gets angry as this violates the covenant. Violates the covenant. Number three, the Lord hands them over to their enemies. Number four, the Israelites cry to God for deliverance from their oppression. So basically, remember what we talked about in Exodus, and we talked about how trouble uh, brings about uh, our you know it heightens our it opens our mind up to our necessity, our need for God. Okay, so things are good, and we start we. Everything's going good, our bank account's fine, our job's going good, everybody's healthy, and we start easing over, just leisurely begin to start, you know, worshiping other things. You know what I mean? But everything's going good, so we get a boat, and we start going to the lake every weekend, and first we miss church once a, a month, then it's two times a month, and so you see... Uh, whatever, you fill in the blank. It's always the same story, and then... Uh, you know, so we're violating this covenant. Now, that's Old Testament language, but we'll translate it into New Testament. So then the Lord hands you over to your enemies. Now, that's Old Testament language. We're going to talk about what does that look like today in a new covenant? What does that, what does that look like when we're handed over to our enemies? A lot of times when, the, when God hands us over to our enemies, at first, we don't even realize it. We think... Oh, in fact, a lot of times when God first hands us over to our enemies, we think he's blessing us. It's going to be fun. We're going to have fun. Okay, then number four, the Israelites cry out for deliverance from their oppression because, hey, now they know something's wrong. Then, number five, the Lord raises up a deliverer or the word judge. You could, you could use the word savior even. Brings a savior, a deliverer, a rescuer to rescue us. Number six, then uh, the Israelites experience a period of peace after the rescuer comes. Peace comes. And then what happens in a time of peace? We forget God's salvation and we start all over again. And around the circle it goes. Okay? No, we don't do that. We never do that. Oh, yeah. These dumb Israelites, if they were smart as us, I mean, boy, we would. So there's this clear mantle of leadership that has changed when uh, it was passed from Moses to Joshua. I mean, you know, for every, it was, you know, everyone knew what was going on. Everyone was accustomed to the system. We follow Moses. And then, you know, now Joshua is going to be the successor, and there's no controversy because Moses basically coronates Joshua. So everyone just follows suit. Like there's no people aren't up in arms going, well, J well Joshua, I mean, we don't want to find, I mean, it's just transition. But now this is all new. And so they they don't really know what's happening, and it's taken a terrible toll on the people. So when Joshua died, there was not uh, any particular person in charge. And so here's what happened. Men failed to lead their families. See, what happened is, in the absence of a strong leader, then the onus passes down to each individual family. And so the failure begins to fall apart at the family structure. Then the chiefs failed to lead their tribes. So there's tribal failure. And then the priests fail to leave their nation. So the whole thing is a disaster. 
So, to help lead Israel against their enemies, God raises up these judges. Now, we're going to talk about all 12 judges. I gave you a list there of each judge and the tribe that they represent. So, next week we'll be talking about Judah. And so we'll go through each of these judges or each of these rescuers, and we'll show you how God provides a rescuer, but how a human rescuer always leaves us wanting more. It's not sufficient to sustain, but every rescuer that God sends rescues his people. It just doesn't sustain because they go right back into the circle again. Around and around they go. Okay? All right. Now, in this book, in all these narratives and judges, you're going to find what seems like a contradiction. Now we're going to have to start thinking a little bit. Because remember, God, God, they go to God. God, what, who needs to go first? God says, Judah, I've already gone before you. He's already got them to this point. He's, you know, th this land is already yours. It's already been divided. Everyone knows which part is whose. It's, everything's done. All you got to do is walk over there and take it. That's all you have to do. Okay? The people bundle it up, and then what is God going to do in response? Now, on the one hand, God demands obedience because he's holy. But on the other hand, he makes promises of commitment and loyalty to his promises. In other words, his people. So God, what comes first? The chicken or the egg? No, what comes first? The promise or the obedience? What always, always comes first? I don't know. I'm asking you. Okay, we, we, we left Egypt. Let's, let's back the truck up. We left Egypt, and we walked across the Red Sea. We went to Mount Sinai. Right? Was there any laws when we got to Mount Sinai? No. There was nobody could break anything. We go up on Mount Sinai. Moses goes up and meets with God. God says, now here's the Ten Commandments comes back down, here's the Ten Commandments, and God says, if you obey my commandments, you'll be my special people, my treasured people, right? And Right? Now, at this point, have they obeyed or broken anything? No, they just got it. God has already made a covenant with Abraham, passed through the two pieces with a smoking pot, in other words, God has already made an irrevocable promise that he's going to make a great nation out of these people. Then he gives them the, the Ten Commandments, tells them, hey, if you do this, this is what you can be. But it doesn't change the Abrahamic covenant that he made all the way back in Genesis 12. So the question is, what's going to happen? Is, the, is God's promise to Abraham in Genesis 12 based on the people's obedience, so if they obey, God's going to do that, or is God going to do that regardless of whether they obey or not, so then if that's the case, then, well, maybe, why do we even obey? There's tension in all of this. See, there's tension between grace and law. There's law and there's grace, and they're both existing in these stories at the same time. And then there's conditionality and unconditionality. See, is God's or his promises conditional or unconditional? I'm, I mean, well, you're going to have to stretch yourself to figure this out. I mean, there's going to be some big-time tension. All right? Let's light the fire. Here's a question for you. Will, and should be capital H, will His holiness and His conditional commands override His promises, or will His promises override His commands? What determines what God will do? Is it the promise, or is it, Obedience. 
In other words, one has to, you would think one has to trump the other, right? I mean, we're stuck in this because God's promise supersedes their, he promises first, then, so what do they do? I mean, what if they, See, you know why there's trouble in the room? Here's why there's trouble in the room. Because everyone in this room, just like you're either right-handed or you're left-handed, I mean, you can try to tell me that you're ambidextrous, but that just means you're not retarded in one hand, You can, but you're still dominant on one side, okay? So you're one or the other, left-handed or right-handed. Well, the same thing applies here. You either see this one way or you see it the other way. And I don't know. You're going to have to decide. So here you go. Figure it out. Either you read the Old Testament and you are. You take what I would call the liberal view. I'm not downing it. I'm just saying that's the only word I know how to use. That says, sure, God's always going to bless us as long as we're sorry for what we did. But I'm not saying that's wrong. I'm just saying that. When you read the Old Testament in your mind, and you know if this is you or not, as you're reading, you're thinking, well, you know, it's going to be okay. They're going to repent. God's going to, you know, he's going to be graceful. He's going to be kind. Or you're, you're going to take a conservative view, and you're going to say, no, God's only going to bless you if you're obedient. And just like you're left-handed or right-handed, you tend to one of these or the other. So I don't know which one, who, where, you know, I don't know where you are, but probably when I was teasing with you a few minutes ago and I was asking you these questions, whichever side you were just, you know, your gut reaction was to tend to, well, that's the side you go to. It doesn't really matter one way or the other. I mean, we've got to fix it either way, so. But one or the other. All right? So Judges is going to leave you in this tension that both are true, but neither are fully true. That the liberal view and the conservative view are both true, but neither one is fully true. Hmm. You're fixing to be confused. You know I like to do this. You see, i got to create tension so then we can solve it. So how is this going to work? Only the New Testament gospel will show us how the two sides can be and are both true. How they coexist without canceling each other out. All right. Now let's, let's, now let's talk for just a second about what happened in chapter one and then we're going to come back to this tension and we're going to try to weave it together a little bit. So in Deuteronomy 7, it is crystal clear there are four specific things that they're supposed to do when they enter into Canaan, when they cross the Jordan. Number one is they're to utterly annihilate the inhabitants. I mean, Moses was so crystal clear. You go over and you annihilate the inhabitants. Does that bother you? See, I also know that you're left-handed or right-handed, and some of you in the room, just because of the way you think, you automatically go, oh, like you think they're, they're innocent people. So you're the one, you're the people who can't watch the uh, lion eat the zebra because you always love the zebra. But that's because you're not a baby lion starving to death waiting for mommy to bring you a, leap, a zebra leg. See? You just think because based on your tendency, right? But if you were a baby lion, you wouldn't be loving that zebra. You'd be eating it. Okay, but then other people watch that and go, wow, look at that lion tearing up that zebra. It's just how you're wired. All right? So he said, go in and annihilate them. So it doesn't matter how you feel about that. That's what God said. Number two, he said, don't make any agreements or covenants with them. Period. Don't make any concessions in any way. Number three, do not marry them. Don't intermarry at all for any reason. 
And number four, tear down any religious altars that exist. Okay, so now when you get home tonight, you go back, flip back over to page one, and I want you to read the end of chapter, and I want you to read how every one of the 12 tribes went across. And now, who was successful, at least in what they set out to do initially, Judah? At least Judah went over there and won. And then it's from Judah down, it gets worse and worse and worse and worse and worse. And in fact, if you read it closely, what you'll find is about midway it starts saying, well, they couldn't drive them out. So they, uh, they allowed them to live among them. And then they changed it over to forced labor after they got strong enough. So not only did they not annihilate them, but then they lived among them. Then they exploited them. Okay, but then if you keep going and you get down to the bottom, the wording switches and it says that the, the, the tribe lived among the Canaanites instead of the other way around. In other words, you see what I'm saying? That the tribe inhabited the Canaanite land. And then it even says twice that, well, they couldn't drive them out because they were more determined. What? God said, go over there. I've already gone before you. It's already done. It's already yours. And they went over there, and the, the inhabitants of the land were more determined. That just means that they were so pitiful and apathetic that they allowed people who were already defeated and given over to them to just be more determined, braver than they were. After Joshua had told them a million times, be strong and courageous, strong and courageous. Don't quit. Do what I told you. Do what I told you. Joshua, when he went to battle, he hooked them up. He was a warrior. There was nowhere Joshua went over and said, well, they'll dwell in mine. That's not how he rolled. Yes. Dead. Like zebras. Okay. Because they're, because they're all, they were all wonderful, sinless people, weren't they? No. They were idolatrous, false god worshipers. Okay? But anyway, what's the principle? What is the number one principle about everything that's happened with these tribes going over there into the land from Judah all the way to Dan? To be partially obedient is to be 100% disobedient. You have got to get this down. Because this is going to mess up some of your theology in this room. To be partially obedient is to be 100% disobedient. Do you, do you believe that? Do you reject that? Is that bothering you? Are you having a hard time with it? Now, how much of the law do you have to keep in order to be righteous? How much, how many mistakes can you make? So you're saying that in God's economy, there's no scale of sin. Like, when I say it that way, you're like, yes, yes. But when it comes to our own personal life, you know what we think? We think, well, some obedience is better than no obedience. See, we think, well, I mean, God told me I ought to do this, and I mean, I tried. Right? So we want partial credit. When it comes to us, we want, let's face it, we want God to grade on a curve. Right? That's what we want. Now, how does it work? But let me flip the tables on you, okay? I will prove to you that this statement is true. All right? So, if you're arguing in your heart with me a little bit, then say this. So, are you saying that it would be untrue to say a partially faithful husband is 100% unfaithful? How, many, how unfaithful do I need to be as a husband to be unfaithful? Now, wait a minute. What if I'm faithful 99% of the time, but 1% I'm unfaithful? Hey, Lisa ought to grade on a curve. You see, none of you are going for that, but when it comes to you and God, you've got a whole different standard. 
You will want your spouse to be 100% faithful to you. But when it comes to you and God, you think, well, partial is better than none. So who in here wants a partially faithful spouse? Nobody. You don't even want a 98% faithful spouse. You're not interested. You see? You see how we twist things around in our head and make it fit our own agenda so that we can worship other gods, so that we can start the cycle around again? Yes! I mean, so, so if we were to take a closer look, remember I told you that a lot of times when, we, when God turns us over to our enemies, we feel like he's blessing us? I want you to, to, well, you can listen or you can flip back over to the front and look at these verses. In verse 27, for example, I just you can put a circle uh, around 27 and 28, and you'll see this principle play out. In 27, it's talking about Manasseh, the tribe of Manasseh, did not drive out the inhabitants, right? They didn't do it. And it talks about how the inhabitants of Dor and its villages and the inhabitants of Iblim and its villages and Megiddo and its villages, the Canaanites were determined to dwell in the land. Now, the very next statement says, verse 28, and it came to pass when Israel was strong. Now, what just happened there? They failed and were disobedient, and they became strong. And then they put the people to hard labor. So now, what, is come, what does this mean? How did they become strong? What does God do? What is one of God's favorite ways to sanctify us when we are disobedient and we feel like he ought to grade on a curve? He gives us what we want. You want, oh, you, you want to worship your kids? Okay, worship them. Worship them. Go, go. God does it. Does God blow up the ball field so that you can't go there every Sunday morning instead of coming to church? No. He lets the games go on. He advances. He lets them go up into the select league. And they start traveling around. And pretty soon scouts from all over the world are calling your house going, we'd like to sign. Nike wants to sign little Johnny to a billion-dollar contract. We think he's the next. Isn't that what happens? Yes. So they get stronger. And so here's what happens. We start thinking, hey, you know what? This is working out great. And then what happens? Crash. That's what happens. God didn't crash it. We crash it. He just says, there you go. You want it? There you go. So guess what? They went over there. They did it their way. They got stronger. They started making everybody their indentured service. I just want to clarify, that's why they got stronger. That's what a lot of times happens in our lives. We actually will, will think God's blessing us. He's not blessing us. We're just pursuing our own way. And we're, we, we can convince ourselves we're beating the system. It's crazy what we can do in our, in our heads. We think, well, here's a, but I'm going to go, I'm going to go twice a week. I'm going to read my Bible once every whatever it is. I'm going to, I mean, we just come up with any kind of stupid scale we can come up with. And we go, well, that's, well, God's going to, no, that's better than, than nothing. And God goes, well, okay. That's what you want. There you go. And you get stronger for a minute. Then, kablam. Look at chapter 2, verse 1. Then the angel of the Lord came down from Gilgal at Bochim. You know what that word Bochim means? It means the weepers. You never want to be at a place called the weepers. So they went down to the weepers and they said, and God said, well, I led you up from Egypt and I brought you to the land which I swore to your fathers. And I said, I will never break my covenant with you, and you shall make no covenant with the inhabitants of the land, and you shall tear down their altars. But you have not obeyed my voice. Why have you done this? Therefore I also said, I will not drive them out before you, but 
They will be thorns in your side, and their gods will be a snare to you. So it was when the angel of the Lord spoke these words to all the children of Israel, and the people lifted up their voices, and they wept. See? Now what we wanted and what we got didn't work out the way we thought, and now we're totally bombed out. And we're like, man, but I'm sorry. I didn't mean it. I didn't mean to do that. Isn't that worth something? Well, I don't know. I'm not God. Then they called the name of the place the Weepers, and they sacrificed there to the Lord. And when Joshua had dismissed the people, the children of Israel went each to his own inheritance to possess the land. So now, wait a minute. What just happened? I thought Joshua was dead. So what, what you have is chapter 1 is letting you know what's been going on. Then chapter 2 comes back and starts back at the beginning where Joshua is and go, now here's how this goes. And you're, you're not seeing the completion of a cycle. You're seeing the beginning of another cycle. And then next week we're going to go right on into from judge for the next 12 weeks. Every week we'll be a different judge. Well, it may take a couple weeks to do Samson and some of these super exciting people. But we'll go through these judges, and you'll see these cycles going around. And you're going to see God. Now listen to me. you got some notes down there. You should at least write this down. Here's some notes I wrote. God is not faithful because we're faithful. God is not faithful because we're faithful. God is faithful because he is faithful. God keeps his promises because he's a promise-keeping God. People who disobey God, God still keeps his promises. Which then you would say, well, wait a second. Then why am I keeping his promises? To which I'm taking you back to where we started, and then I'm done. Remember what I said about it's all about relationship and how does relationship work? Your kids are always your kids. But some days it's up here and some days it's down here. If you're God's child, you're always God's child. But guess what? Some days it's up here and some days it's down here. Now, what determines if it's up here or down here? Does it have anything to do with God? No, it does not. It does not. It has everything to do with you and me. So are you up here? Are you down here? I don't know. That's up to you. So what happens? You, you decide you want to worship a false god. You decide you want to do your own thing. God says, fine, do your own thing. It doesn't make you not his child. You don't go out. He doesn't unadopt you. You don't leave his family. But what happens? It goes good for a while, but then it's not so great, is it? And so then you go down to you're still his child. You go up and you go down, and you go up and you go down. And why do you do that? Because it's a cycle, isn't it? Oh, yeah, it's the same seven steps over and over. And I do the same thing, and you, we all do the same thing. And it's God's sanctifying process. And you know what he does? He, he keeps his promise continually for the whole entire, for all of eternity. He never breaks his promises. And our obedience, our obedience determines our experience within his covenant promise. And so the judges are going to teach us that. They're going to teach us what the gospel could look like if a judge came who was the ultimate judge, who could rescue his people ultimately. So then now, okay, I can't resist before we go. So then now in the New Testament, how does this word in the New Do you ever think to yourself like, why did God say that? Why does the New Testament say that God... Why doesn't it say that God uh, is the discerner of every action of, of his children? It doesn't say that. It says he's the discerner of the thoughts and the intentions of our heart, right? Which is where this grace thing comes in, which is where this mercy thing comes in, which is where this... And guess what? You can't beat that system, can you? No. So guess what? When you sin, you make a conscious decision to sin. Now, what if you what if you stumble into sin? You didn't even know it was a sin. It totally caught you off guard. You didn't know nothing about it. Well, God judges the thoughts and intention of your heart. But I'm just telling you right now, 
that almost never happens. It does happen, but it almost never happens, especially not in this room. You see, the thoughts and intention. That's the that's how the curve. Okay, we got to pray. Man, that is good. That is rich. So we're going to see this tension, and we'll start resolving it, and it'll start shaping the way that we think about God and how he's working in our lives, and you'll be able to think every week about what you're experiencing in his, as his child in his family. Amen. Let's pray. God, thank you for your word. We love you. You are so good to us. Thank you for the book of Judges. Thank you for all these amazing stories that we're going to hear, all these things that are going to teach us amazing things. Lord, thank you for being so open and honest with us. God, this, just tonight, what we read in your book sounds like things we read in the newspaper, we hear on the news. People really haven't changed. We're still the same, and you are the same. And this world is vastly changing every moment of every day, and yet, God, our flesh is the same, and you are the same. Thank you for being a covenant-keeping God. You never break your promise, ever, in the history of all the world. Thank you. We love you tonight. It's good to be your kids. In Jesus' name, amen.